um, Jimmy talk to you about the first kind of primitive structure in Bitcoin, which is a transaction. Uh, Bitcoin is a, a digital currency, so obviously we need some way of transferring value around, and that is a transaction. Um, he also talked to you about the first cryptographic primitive we use in Bitcoin, which is ECDSA, which is signing, digital signing over the elliptic curve over a finite field. This session is going to be about the next building block, if you like, of the blockchain, which is a block. Um, it's the second primitive data structure in Bitcoin. And I'm also going to introduce you to the second primitive cryptographic um, feature of Bitcoin, which is hashing. So first of all, a bit about me. I live in New York. I work for a small company called Chaincode Labs. We are a research and development company on cryptographic currencies, cryptocurrencies, and we work mainly on Bitcoin. I almost exclusively work on Bitcoin. I contribute to Bitcoin Core. Um, Bitcoin people are not very trusting, so if you want to verify that's me, you can see I'm wearing my favorite t-shirt. Um, if you want to verify that I do indeed contribute to Bitcoin Core, that's my GitHub. All right. So in this session, I'm going to cover blocks and the blockchain. First of all, from a very high level, why do we have a blockchain? What, what problems does that solve? I'm going to talk about proof of work and mining and how those two things are linked. I'm going to talk about difficulty on the blockchain and how difficulty gets changed over time. I'm going to talk about, I haven't finished that sentence, how new Bitcoin are created out of thin air or out of hard work, if you prefer. I'm then going to talk about the actual data structure of a block. What does it look like? What a block header is? And what you'll find in a block header? I'll talk about how transactions are included in a block. And I'll talk about how we agree on what the current status of the blockchain is. And then finally, I'll talk a bit about SegWit, segregated witness. OK? So why do we need a blockchain? Jimmy talked about transactions this morning, and transactions include a digital signature. So when you see a Bitcoin transaction as a third party, as an observer, you can validate for yourself that that is a valid transaction. So the tra transactions validate themselves. You're not trusting anyone to tell you whether a transaction is good and true. You do that yourself. Everyone can do that. So if Alice wants to pay Bob, she uses some of her unspent coins, she creates a transaction, she signs with her private key. That's what you did this morning. But bits are cheap, right? You have computers, there are lots of bits on your computer, and Alice can very easily create a second transaction paying Carol with the same unspent coins. That's also a valid transaction. So to someone watching, how do they know which one is correct? This is called the double spend problem. So to solve that, um, we need to know which of those transactions came first, right? If Alice pays Bob and then tries to pay Carol with the same coins, we need to be able to say, whoa, 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 you've already spent those. So we need an ordering, right? We need to all come to some agreement about which order transactions arrived on the Bitcoin network. Now, in a centralized system like a bank or credit cards, it's really easy, right? You have a third party and they tell you which order transactions arrived in. Banks, credit card companies, PayPal, they're all third parties. You trust them, they tell you if a transaction is good because it came in the right order. And until some point in time, no one knew how we could create a shared ledger with an ordering without a trusted third party until 2008 when Satoshi Nakamoto published this paper about a system he called Bitcoin. In that paper, he says, he's talking about transactions as a, a chain of these signatures. And he goes on to say, the main benefits are lost if a trusted third party is still required to prevent double spending. We propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer network. The network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain of hash-based proof of work, forming a record that cannot be changed without redoing the proof of work. So how do, we, how do we solve that double spend problem? We distribute the ledger amongst everyone 
on the network, on the Bitcoin network. And the different nodes take, it, take turns adding a new page of transactions to the ledger. We call that page a block. How do we decide who gets to add the next block? We determine that using a hash-based proof-of-work contest. And we'll get into what that means later. Um, Satoshi described that as one CPU, one vote. It's an example of where Satoshi had a, an idea about Bitcoin, and as that system has developed, we've realized that his vision was not complete, right? Because we don't use CPUs to vote anymore. We use dedicated hardware called ASICs. So it's not exactly one CPU, one vote. It's one hash, one vote. And how does that fit with a blockchain? I've talked about doing work on a block. Well, the proof of work on a block commits a block to the transactions. And I'll talk about what that means in terms of co a commitment. It also commits it to the previous block. So a block can't be changed without redoing that work. If you want to change the transactions in the block, if you want to reorder them, the block becomes invalid and you need to redo the work. If you want to go back in time and change a block in history, you need to redo the work for that block and all of the subsequent blocks. Is everyone happy with that? Any questions at this point? It's all kind of high level stuff. Good. Okay, let's talk about what exactly proof of work is and what mining is. So proof of work is what Satoshi used to solve that double spend problem. And it was based on earlier systems, including Adam Back's hash cash. Um, you know, these ideas float around a lot, so I don't want to say that he invented it. This kind of idea was floating around in the 2000s, and Satoshi took that work. He cites Adam Back's hash cash in his white paper, but there were certainly similar ideas around the same time. And what it is, is it requires a miner to do some kind of computational work in order to discover a new block. We say a, a, a block is valid. When a block is valid, it's been discovered. So when I say a, a, a cryptographic hash-based solution, what is a cryptographic hash? Well, if you've done computer science 101, you'll know what a hash is. It takes some arbitrary, arbitrarily long piece of data, a message, and outputs a fixed length digest to that message. That digest is, can be thought of as a fingerprint um, of, of what that input was. A cryptographic hash has some additional properties. We say it's infeasible to generate the message from its digest. Right? That's called pre-image resistance. So let's unpack that a bit. What does infeasible mean? It means it's really difficult. Right? We don't know better than um, brute forcing. And brute forcing would take many, many two to the n computations. Um, a small change to the message results in a completely different digest, right? So hash functions are carefully constructed, so if you change one bit in the input, the output will be completely different. And it's also infeasible. Again, infeasible means really difficult, it requires a lot of computation to find two different messages with the same hash digest. That's called a collision resistance. So a cryptographic hash is a one-way function. If you're looking at this from the outside, the outputs look completely random. Um, there's no way to go from the digest back to the message. So it's a little bit like ECDSA, right? ECDSA is, is kind of a one-way function. If you have the trapdoor, you can go back, which is a, the private key. Uh, but, but without the private key, you can't go back. Hashing is, is similar. It's one way, but there's no private key. This is what a hash looks like. If you have a pre-image, it's really easy. It requires very little work to go from the pre-image to the digest. But going back is really, really difficult. So let's try that out. Let's demonstrate that. Um, if you open up your Jupyter Notebooks, there was, um, you already looked at the transactions notebook. Let's look at the blocks notebook. Okay. 
Has everyone got that? The first thing you need to do is run that import cell. So just select it, hit Shift, Enter, and that will import all of the, the required modules. And then we're going to look at cryptographic hashes. So there, there are the three properties that I mentioned earlier. It's infeasible to generate the message from its digest. A small change to the input results in a completely different output, and it's infeasible to find two different messages with the same digest. So the first question is, what is the, what's the digest of dev++? And when I say double SHA-256, SHA-256 is a, an example of a cryptographic hash function, and double means we're just running through that function twice. So I've, I've defined a, a short function here which calls that double SHA-256 and prints out the, the hex. So if I run that, then the output you can see is a, this 32-byte hex string starting 0x, showing its hex, and then A75B. So what's the double SHA digest of dev plus plot? Okay, I've changed one bit in the input, and you can see that the output is completely different. Does that make sense to everyone? Everyone happy with that? Okay, and the third question is, um, there's a prize for this. What's the pre-image for this digest? Anyone get that one? No? Okay. Good. Um, plus plus dev. Oh, look at that. Did I break it? Yeah. No, I didn't break SHA-256. I knew the answer already. Um, but if you don't know the answer, it's really difficult to go backwards. That's the, that's the whole point of a cryptographic one-way hash function. Any questions on that? This is all, this is all the building blocks. Hopefully most of you have come across these concept, concepts already, but I'm just kind of putting them out there. All right, SHA-256, that's a cryptographic hash function. Um, it's a variant of SHA-2 with an output of 256 bits. And essentially, those outputs are randomly distributed, right? So there'll be 256 bits in the output. Half of all of those, half of all possible messages will have a digest with a leading zero. When I put zero, zero B at the front, that means I'm showing you the binary representation of the output. So half of the outputs start with a zero, and half start with a one. One fourth of all messages start with two zeros, right? Because each of those bits is independently random. They're not random, it's deterministic, but they, the distribution is random. And one-eighth of all messages start with three zeros. That's two to the three. Pretty, pretty straightforward, and so on. So in general, out one out of two to the x messages will hash to a digest with x leading zeros. What do I mean when I say proof of work over a message? Well, you start with a message, and then you append some random bits to the end of the message. We'll call this a nonce, a number used once. And for now, let's call that concatenation of the message plus a nonce a block. Hash a block using SHA-256. And if the output of that hash starts with a target number of zeros, it's a valid block. We've discovered a block. If not, the block's invalid. Go back to one and try a different nonce. So if the difficulty is four, zeros, then on average, you'll need to try 16 different nonces to find a valid block. Now, on average is really important there. It's not, you won't be guaranteed if you try 16. You, you might be lucky and find a block with the first nonce you try. Or you might be really unlucky and have to try 100 before you find a valid block. Or you might never find a block, indeed. You need to do 16 on average. An observer if they want to validate your work, it needs to do one, right? They take your nonce and they hash it with a message, and if it comes out 
to a digest with the, the correct number of leading zeros. They know that you've discovered a valid block, and they know that on average you've done 16 bits of work. So let's try that. If you go back to your workbook, the next exercise down, we're going to do proof of work over a message. That message is dev++. Um, so if you just run that cell as it is, I have this function called validate block. It takes the arguments message, nonce, and difficulty. And the last line in that cell is saying, let's do, let's try nonce one as a string and uh, hash out with dev plus plus and see if that's got, got four leading zeros. And the answer is no, it's an invalid block. So can you, can you find by changing that nonce, changing this value here, keep guessing until you find a valid block. You're going to do some work. I'm making you do work. How's everyone getting on? Have you all discovered a block? Yeah. yeah? Okay, once you discover your block, tell your partner, the person sitting next to you, what your nonce is, and they can validate your block. <coughs> okay, we're gonna hurry on through because we don't have much time. Um, just like in Bitcoin, we have technological advances like using a range loop, which means we don't need to manually try every single nonce. And it turns out that using the nonce, nonce 20, produces a valid block, right? I cheated. Well, I used a computer. Any questions about that? Cool. Let's continue. All right, so what's Bitcoin mining? Well, it's exactly the same as what you just did, right? They're not using the message dev++. They're not doing work over a message dev++. They're doing work over a block header, which is 76 bytes of metadata plus four bytes of um, nonce. The current difficulty on the Bitcoin requires about 70 leading zeros, right? So you need to do about two to the 70 hashes. That's a lot of hashes. Um, in order to discover a valid block. And in small writing, I don't know if you can read it, but note that four bytes is not enough nonce space, right? Two to the 32 is only about four trillion, I think. Um, and that's not enough, right? Because there are 70 leading zeros. So they need to find extra places to put in that entropy, and we'll talk about that later. How does that fit in with a chain of blocks? Well, the block header includes a hash to the previous block. So when you're mining a block, that block contains the transactions. You're committing to those transactions. So if you change the transaction, you need to redo the work. But it also contains a hash of the previous block. So you're really doing work over the entire chain. And mining is a race to extend that chain. When a miner discovers a new block, they publish it, and all of the other miners on the network try to build a, top, a block on top of that, right? The consensus rules say that the, the chain with the longest, sorry, the chain with the most accumulated work following the consensus rules is the, the tip, and miners build on the tip. So I talked about difficulty. We, we did some work with four bits of difficulty. Let's look a bit more at what difficulty exactly is and how it changes. Why does it change? Well, Satoshi designed Bitcoin in 2008 
and he decided for whatever reason that blocks should come every 10 minutes. It turns out that's quite a good time. Um, if you make it much shorter, then that advantages the miner of the previous block because whilst he's working on the next block, everyone else is validating that previous block. So you don't want the time interval to be too short. Obviously, you don't want it to be too long um, because that makes the system quite difficult to use. 10 minutes is what he decided. Um, and note the word on average here, right? It's, a, it's basically a Poisson distribution. So some blocks arrive one minute after the previous block. Some blocks arrive half an hour after the previous block. But on average, we want blocks to be coming out every 10 minutes. So he started mining with his computer or his set of computers, and there was a small amount of hash rate on the network. And as the system became more popular, as other people started entering Bitcoin and mining, and mining technology improved, that network hash rate increases. Right? There's more computers, more efficient computers, hashing these different nonces. And so the hash rate across the network has increased, which means that if difficulty remains the same, right, if, we, if we fix the number of leading zeros that we're hoping to get, then blocks would, become, would be discovered much more quickly. Right? You double the hash rate, you half the expected time. And so if, if difficulty hadn't changed, at today's network hash rate, blocks would be discovered every 0 0.0000000004 seconds. That's pretty quick. Um, and it kind of it breaks the system. So we need to change that difficulty. We need to readjust it based on the network hash. Um, how, is it how is that difficulty validated? Well, the block header contains a four byte field called the bits field. We'll talk about exactly what a block header looks like later. And the double SHA hash of the block is compared with that bits field. The bits field somehow encodes how difficult the block needs to be. Right? That's called a, a non-contextual check because it's not looking at data outside of the block. It's looking at a piece of data inside the block and comparing the hash of the block to that data. So it's, it's not contextual on any outside information. That difficulty bits field is compared against the prior the blocks in the chain, and that's called a contextual check, right? Because depending on where the block is in the chain, that could be valid or invalid. So it's kind of an indirect way of checking the difficulty against the blockchain. It seems a bit weird, but in fact, other things in Bitcoin also have this indirect checking, um, for example, lock time when used in a script. Let's have a look at those bits. I'm going to, later in this presentation, I'll talk about the block header in total, but let's have a look at those four bits first. It's a, it's a four byte field encoded little endian, so one eight there, that's uh, the first byte, and then the next three bytes are zero one, three C, E nine, right? So you're, you're flipping the order. So the leading one eight, that's called the exponent. It, it, the encoding is a bit like a floating point, if you know floats. Um, so there's an exponent, and then there's a coefficient or a mantissa. That exponent like shifts those bytes up and down, and the coefficient, sorry, the exponent shifts it, and the coefficient um, is what the, the bytes are. So I'll explain it. I don't know if you can read this, but if you look at the coefficient, 13CE9, that appears in the target, sandwiched between a bunch of zeros, and the exponent, the 18, um, means that it's been shifted up. Like, that's why there are so many zeros underneath it. And the exact formula is given by the coefficient times 2 to the power 8 times the exponent minus 3. Don't know why that minus 3 is in there, but um, that means that every time you add one to the exponent, it shifts it up another 8 bits. And this is our target. So when we hash a block, we need it to be lower than this with all of those leading zeros. Can you, is this blocking your view, this whiteboard? Do you want me to move it? There you go. Okay, so just like our example where we wanted four leading zeros, this has got a load of leading zeros. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna try this now. Um, if you go back to your workbook, we're gonna work out what the current target is on the Bitcoin mainnet. 
Okay, did everyone get the same answer? So if you go to SmartBit, that's a, a block explorer, you can see the bits field, and note that that's displayed in Big Endian, so they've, they've already flipped the bits for you. It's 1800EB30, you plug that into the, the formula, and you get a, a target. That's what the target is for that block on the Bitcoin mainnet. I went to SmartBit, it's linked to from the, um, the workbook there. Blockchain.info doesn't show the bits. Any questions about those? It's kind of a weird encoding, yeah. What are the big bits about? Uh, the, the, bits, the, the bits that we got from uh, SmartBit. Uh, yep, okay, I'll, I'll go into how retargets work. But the, the end bits, these bits that we're talking about here, those are set based on the prior blocks in the blockchain. So that's how the, the difficulty gets calculated and retargeted. And then we compare the hash of our, our block to the bits in our block. So there's, there's that two-step where, um, so this, this contextual check here, um, we're checking that the end bits are correct based on the timestamps of prior blocks, and I'll, I'll talk about how we do that. And the, the step above is checking that the block is valid according to those bits. Let's, let's continue and see if it makes sense after this. Before we do that, let's talk about difficulty. If you go to a block explorer, this is, I think, blockchain.info, you'll see a difficulty field. Um, that is not something that, is, that appears on the blockchain. That is something for humans to read, right? Um, target is kind of meaningless to us. If we look at target, right, it's this bunch of zeros, it's really difficult for someone to parse those and understand what it means. And the, the bits is also kind of meaningless to us, unless you know exactly what you're looking at. So difficulty is a, a much more human-friendly way of expressing the target. And difficulty is saying that this block is n times more difficult than the genesis block, which is difficulty one, the lowest possible difficulty. This example here is saying, that this block was 1.196 trillion times more difficult than the Genesis block. You need to do 1.196 trillion times more work to discover this block. The lowest possible difficulty corresponds to the Genesis block, 0xffff001d, which is that target there. You'll notice that there are a lot fewer leading zeros in, in your example. That means it's easier. So you divide the lowest allowed difficulty by your, your own block's difficulty to get the target. Does that make sense? Um, so let's try it now. Let's look at the difficulty on a block explorer and um, try and work out the target from that. Okay? So using the difficulty from that block explorer, we can work out what the target is. And it's roughly the same. So the difficulty is not exact. It's, it's, a, um, it's not an integer, it's a long number with some trailing decimal points, so this target won't be exact, and that reflects that this is, that difficulty isn't really a, um, something that figures in Bitcoin consensus. It's just a way for humans to talk about difficulty. Any questions about that? Everyone happy? Yeah. Okay, so how does difficulty change? Um, we need to keep blocks at 10 minute intervals. And so every 2016 blocks, we do what's called a retarget. 2016 corresponds to what we'd hope would be two weeks, right? So every 10 minutes means six blocks every hour, which means 144 blocks every day 
which means 2016 blocks every two weeks. And because we expect a block to take 10 minutes, 2016 blocks should take 20,160 minutes. If the prior 2016 blocks took longer than that, make the target easier. And if the prior 2016 blocks took less time than that, make the target harder. So retargeting is done by the Bitcoin network automatically. We don't have a central party saying that this is how difficult a block should be. We use the blockchain itself. We use the timestamps in the header. And the timestamps are taken in every retarget window from block zero and block 2015, which sounds a bit odd, right? We're looking at the time for 2016 blocks and we're only looking at 2015 blocks. So Satoshi made an, a bug there. There's an off by one bug. Why don't we just fix that? Blocks are gonna be a little bit too fast because of this. So why has no one fixed that yet? Right, it's a hard fork. Every node on the network is expecting the difficulty to change based on 2015 blocks. We can't just change things in consensus. That's called a hard fork. Um, so we live with this bug. And it's an, an example of one of the bugs that Satoshi introduced that we live with because it's not worth changing. It's not worth having a hard fork to change that. Yep. It should be zero to 2016. It should be zero in this target window to zero in the next target window, right? It's, it, it's saying you should do go from the the first block in retarget window X to the first block in retarget window X plus one. In fact, what we're doing is the first block in retarget window X to the last block in retarget window X. So we're not we're we're missing the time delta from block 2015 to block 2016. Yeah. Uh, two questions. So is that bug uh, something that's sort of in like the hard fork wish list type of thing that would I have. Are you talking, you're talking about SpoonNet, I guess, which is a. Um, I haven't looked at that in detail, but it could and be. And uh, also, is there a reasoning behind that number of blocks for the retargeting period? I think it's arbitrary. Yeah, you know, Satoshi invented this system in private, and he made lots of decision design decisions, and this was one of them. It's, it seems okay to me. Okay, another interesting fact about this is that the miner who discovers that block, 2015, has a chance to slightly change the difficulty, right? Because we're only looking at the timestamp from zero to 2015, right? In actuality, that's not really that gameable. It doesn't really matter that much. But think about those things. Um, if, you're, if you're making an algorithm based on timestamps that miners put in the block, that algorithm might be gameable because they can put whatever they want in there within reason. Okay, so let's try it now. Let's calculate the difficulty for block 491904. So we're gonna, 491904 is the first block of a new difficulty retarget. We're gonna look at the, the prior blocks and work out the difficulty ourselves. So all you need to do is plug in the correct numbers up here. And plus or minus, this is kind of emulating what Bitcoin Core does to retarget difficulty. So target from bits is what we, we used before. I just put it in a function. Um, we're getting the target from the first block in the previous retarget window. That's 489888. We're getting the timestamps for block zero and block 2015 in that previous timestamp window. We are setting the new target to the old target, multiplying it by the actual time difference, dividing it by um, 20,160, how long it should have taken, and then the new target is 
I'm, I'm hacking around with it a bit here because it's not exact, but um, this is the output, the difficulty. The target is C1 BD with a bunch of zeros. And if you look up that block in the Block Explorer and you look up the bits and you calculate the difficulty, you'll see indeed that it is, that is correct. Any questions about that? Everyone happy? Yes, good. All right. Um, a few more facts about that retarget algorithm. It was designed by Satoshi, of course. It's part of consensus, so it can't really change without a hard fork. And if you imagine back in 2008 and before, Satoshi was working on this cryptocurrency, which no one else knew about, and there weren't altcoins, there weren't forks. Um, he was just inventing it from scratch, right? It was the first of its type. And nowadays, we have lots of different altcoins. We have people trying to make forks of the Bitcoin network. And this algorithm might not be perfect. I don't know. Um, it do, it's not very tolerant to large changes in network hash rate. So for example, if network hash rate dropped by 90% and only 10% of the network hash continued to mine Bitcoin, blocks would be discovered on average every 100 minutes instead of every 10 minutes. That means instead of taking two weeks for a retarget, it would take 20 weeks. And because the maximum change in difficulty is plus or minus 4x, um, the next, after the next retarget, blocks will be discovered every 25 minutes on average. Right? This, is, this is assuming hash rate on the network is constant, which is a, a really bad assumption, but go with it. Um, so yeah, it's not very tolerant to large swings in hash rate. And people have tried to fix this in altcoins. Um, often attempts to fix the retarget uh, lead to other changes, create their own problems. For example, Bitcoin Cash's EDA leads to very large swings in block time and difficulty. Yep. Why is there a difficulty change with the maximum four times? Again, that was a decision by Satoshi. Um, it turns out that that's quite useful because it means we have upper and lower bounds on how many blocks can be discovered over a time period. So if we're off the network for a long time and then we see another chain, um, we know how much difficulty to expect because it can't change too much. Um, but again, another design, design decision by Satoshi. Yeah. All right, so that's what I'm gonna say on difficulty. Any questions before we move on to Mining, uh, minting. So this is a mint. It's where new coins get created. Uh, we also have mints in, in Bitcoin. They're called miners. So why do miners mine? It's a really expensive hobby, right? You need really expensive equipment called ASICs. You need lots of electricity. You need lots of cooling. Labor costs are high. So why, why would a miner mine? Well, here's a hint, it's not from the benevolence of the miner that we expect our blocks, but from their regard to their own interest, with apologies to Adam Smith. Um, they mine because they get paid to mine, right? They get rewarded for their efforts. And the way they get rewarded is that every new block contains a special kind of transaction called a Coinbase. And that Coinbase will give the miner new Bitcoin out of thin air or out of hard work. Um, that's called the block subsidy or the reward, and it's paid out in the first transaction in that block called the Coinbase. So in the first block, the Genesis block, the reward was 50 Bitcoin. That 50 Bitcoin in the Genesis block, here's a little bit of trivia, is unspendable, but yeah. After that, every block contained 50 new Bitcoin, which were spendable. And after 210,000 blocks, that's approximately four years, if our assumption that blocks come every 10 minutes is correct, that reward is halved. So instead of 50 Bitcoin, a new block contains 
25 Bitcoin. And after another 210,000 blocks, the reward is halved again to 12 and a half Bitcoin, and then six and a quarter, and then 3.125. And after 33 of these halvings, that's 6.9 million blocks, the reward reduces to zero, right? Before that, it was one Satoshi per block, and then it goes down to zero. Um, another fun bit of trivia, because of the way that Satoshi implemented this halving using bit shifts, after some many millions of more blocks, the reward goes back up again. But that was fixed in bit 42 by Peter Wooler. Okay, so what's the total supply of Bitcoin? And that's the next exercise. Okay, so you should have something similar to that. There's 50 Bitcoin in the initial subsidy, 210,000 blocks per halving, and we got 33 halvings because after that, the left shift um, brings the, the amount down to zero. So after the first halving, there's 10.5 million Bitcoin, and then after the second halving, there's 15.75 million Bitcoin. We're, at the moment, we're somewhere between halving two and three, so there's about 16, 17 million Bitcoin. And as you can see, eventually we get to 21 million. I mean, you, you could have worked that out if you knew a bit about how one over two to the n sums as a sequence, but this gives you, you know, shows you. And that's what Bitcoin inflation looks like. So the blue line is the total supply of Bitcoin. You can see half of the Bitcoin that will ever exist were mined in the first 210,000, and then it tails off. And then the orange line is the inflation rate. Currently, inflation is around 4%. At the next halving, it will half to 2%. Yeah? Is this the initial subsidy to the shape like 50 times 10 times 10 times 10? Um, what, what's that mean? Oh, the times times? <laughs> That's um, in Python, that means to the power. So 50 times 10 to the 8 because there's 100,000 Satoshi in one Bitcoin. Yep. Any other questions? All right, so what happens when the Bitcoin run out? What happens when the final Bitcoin has been mined? Well, in fact, miners receive their subsidy as the, or they receive their reward as the block subsidy, plus the transaction fees of all the transactions they include in their block. So the transaction fee is the sum of the inputs to a transaction less the sum of the outputs. And when you send a transaction on the Bitcoin network, you elect to include some level of transaction fee. Why do you do that? Well, because the miners choose transactions to include in the block based on their fee rate, right? That's the amount of fee divided by the size of the transaction. One megabyte per block means that space in a block is a limited resource, it's a scarce resource, and that scarce resource is assigned to transactions based on how much that transaction pays. It's kind of like an auction or a clearinghouse. When blocks aren't full, when there's no competition, then fees are very low, almost zero. And as demand for block space increases, as we've seen over the last few years, the fees will rise, right? So what happens when the subsidy goes away and the fees rise? That's kind of an open question. It's a system that we don't really know about. You know, we can make guesses about what will happen and models. Um, you know, there have been a few papers about what Bitcoin looks like after the subsidy has gone. But it's, you know, it's a dynamic system. We don't really know until we try it. It's an open question. Right, okay, let's have a quick break. Um, that's quite a lot of information. Or well, are there any questions before we break? Is there some kind of consensus around what the fees might be when it runs out? I mean, is there a, <coughs> people typically converge on some number in their estimates, or are they all over the place? Uh, the question is, is there some kind of, do, do, do we have some idea of what fees will be after the subsidy runs out? We don't know. It, it depends on a lot of factors. It depends on the demand for Bitcoin transactions, and that in turn depends on how people are using Bitcoin. Right? If, if everyone's using Lightning and second layer solutions, 
it will be different. If we've had a hard fork and the block size has changed, it'll be different. Um, if the price of Bitcoin is different, it, it's, it's a very difficult thing to predict, I would say. Yep. Has there ever been a BIP on uh, changing the retarget rate or anything of that nature? Um, no, I don't think so. So people talk about what what happens. You know, there's a hard fork coming up called 2x. Uh, we don't know what will happen to the hash rate on the Bitcoin network. Some people suggest we might need to change the proof of work algorithm or the retarget algorithm. I, I don't think there's much appetite for that in Bitcoin Core, but who knows? Maybe Jeremy. It's interesting to note that you could soft fork the difficulty increase, I think, but probably not a difficulty decrease. Right, yeah, you can change. You can change a lot with soft forks more than you might imagine, and you can change the difficulty algorithm with a soft fork rather than a hard fork. But it's a bit of a hack. It's a lot of a hack. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So a lot of the code that we're seeing here right now um, could be seen in a Bitcoin type library. Uh, yeah. yeah, it would be similar. Uh, this, this code is all kind of hacked together by me. So it's, it's, not, it's not production code. It's just to demonstrate ideas. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break and then I've got more about blocks and the actual structure of blocks. We talked about proof of work, difficulty, mining. Um, I talked about how our new Bitcoin created. Um, for the remainder of the session, I'm gonna talk about what a block actually looks like. What is this thing that I've been talking about for the last hour without showing you? Um, I'm gonna talk about a block header I'm going to talk about the Coinbase transaction as well. I'm going to talk about how transactions are included in a block. What do I mean when I say that? I'm going to talk about how we agree on the current state of the blockchain. And then we'll talk about SegWit just a little bit at the end. OK, block structure. Uh, blocks consist of a block header. Right, That's information about the block. That's 80 bytes. Um, and then it, there are tra transactions in a block. The serialized transactions, they come after the header, and that's up to one megabyte prior to SegWit. The block can be up to four megabytes after SegWit. Four megabytes is a bit of a, um, that would be an outlier. We expect them to be maybe 1.8 to two megabytes if the, the, the block is full of SegWit transactions. Okay, a block header contains various pieces of information. It contains the version of the block, that's four bytes. It contains the hash of the previous block. That's why you call it a blockchain, because each block is linking to the prior block in the chain. It contains something called a Merkle root of the transactions. That's another 32 bytes. It contains those difficulty bits that I talked about earlier, that's four bytes, the exponent and the coefficient. It contains a timestamp that the miner puts in the block saying this is when we mined this block or when we started working on this block. And it contains a nonce, which is a random, 32 bits of randomness, essentially. No, the nonce is, the, the, nonce is the, the tries that the miner is doing to get that proof of work. Just like, Earlier, when you did your proof of work over the message dev++, you're trying random strings in there. That's what a nonce is for the miner. OK, so let's have a look at that. Um, let's parse a block. And when a block is sent over the wire, it's 80 bytes of header. That's what you see at the top there, 160 hex characters, 80 bytes. The first four bytes are the version. Why is it doing this? OK, here we go. Um, the version is four bytes, little endian, which means that the byte order is reversed. So that 0, 02000020 0, 0, comes out as 20000002. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, um, the leading three bytes, sorry, the leading three bits, 0, 0, 001, indicate that this is signaling for a BIP9 deployment. That's version bits. It's a way we roll out new soft forks, new upgrades to the protocol. So 001 
means that that leading hex character will always be a two if it's 0010 zero, 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 or a three if it's 0011. Zero, zero, one, one. The remaining 29 bits, remember there are 32 bits here, we've used three in that leading 001, can be used for separate soft fork deployments. Right? So we can have up to 29 soft fork deployments in flight concurrently. Um, the first bit, bit zero, uh, that would be a one at the end of this hex number, was used to signal CSV, check, sequence, verify. That was a soft fork upgrade. Bit one is used to signal for bit 141, that's SegWit. So you can see that this, this block is signaling for SegWit because the final byte is 02. And then bit four was used to signal for something called SegSignal or bit 91 as a way of activating SegWit with 80% support instead of 95%. So all of this stuff, this is version bits. That was introduced maybe two years ago. Prior to that, the block version would be an, represent a number instead of a bit field. So prior to a couple of years ago, you'd see blocks with version one, two, three, four. Any questions about that? Make sense? Okay, so that's the first four bytes. Uh, next, 32 bytes of um, previous block hash. It's really sad because um, I'm having to use TeamViewer because we have problems with our AV, so you don't get all the Prezi zooming around. Oh well. Um, so the previous block hash is 32 bytes. It's the output of a SHA-256 hash. It's little endian, little endian again. So the, the most significant bit is at the end. And the value for this hash is 0, 0, 0, 0, like a bunch of leading zeros. Why, why are there a bunch of leading zeros in there? Why would the previous block hash to something with a bunch of leading zeros? Right, that's how proof of work works. So every block in the blockchain will start with a bunch of zeros. More recent blocks will have more zeros. Okay, so if you look at those bytes at the top, you'll always see a bunch of zeros in the middle of a block header. That's because of, that's an artifact of how proof of work works. Next 32 bits, sorry, 32 bytes are the Merkle root of all of the transactions included in that block. Um, and we're using a, some, a construction called a Merkle tree, named after Ralph Merkle. It's a way of taking a big set of objects and hashing them down to a single digest. They're constructed in this binary tree format, and the way it's calculated is each transaction is hashed pairwise with its neighbor to go up to the next level in the tree, and then they're hashed, pair, hashed pairwise again until you end up with a single digest. Does that make sense? It's a way of hashing together a bunch of objects. And the nice thing about Merkle trees is you can do proofs of inclusion. We'll talk a bit, a bit about that later. So there's a bunch of transactions. The first transaction in a block is always the Coinbase transaction. Special transaction, it doesn't spend any previous funds, it creates new coin out of thin air. It's always the first, it pays out the Coinbase reward. Uh, that, that's the block subsidy, subsidy plus the fees of the other transactions in that block. Also, since bit 34, it contains the block height. So if you look at the block header, there's no indication of what the height is. That's included in the Coinbase transaction. It's actually included in the script SIG. It also contains the Merkle root of the witnesses for all of the SegWit transactions. So this is how we get the commitment for those witnesses into the header. And then it's also used for extra nonce space. So if you remember, I said that there's four bytes at the end. The nonce, 32 bits of entropy is not enough when you need 70 leading zeros. So you need to get more entropy in, and the miners do that using the Coinbase transaction. Any questions about that? All make sense? Good. OK, next is a timestamp. This is, again, a four-byte little Indian integer. Is there some, something playing? <laughs> Hello, Star Citizen and Variety Streamer on Twitch. It's going to a speaker, so the entire room. Okay. 
Sorry about that. So timestamp is a four byte integer. Um, it's a Unix timestamp. You can see that for this block, the value is um, 1.5 billion and some, right? That is 1.5 billion seconds since January 1st, 1970. It's a Unix timestamp, and that is equivalent to August 31st this year at 2.43 a.m. UTC. The timestamp is set by the miner. Now, we, we don't have a canonical view of what time is on the network. You know, every, every node has its own idea of what time is, but we have a rough idea of what time is. For a block to be valid, the timestamp needs to be after the median of the previous 11. That's easy. We can look at the timestamps in the previous blocks. And it also needs to be less than two hours in the future, according to our system clock. Right, that two hours means that if the miner's clock is ahead of ours and they put a, a timestamp in which is ahead of our system timestamp, we don't think that block is invalid unless it's way in the future, two hours. By our system, you mean the node that's tracking the transaction? Sorry, say that again? Two hours ahead of? Two hours ahead of my node that is looking at that block. Yeah, every, every node on the network is doing this check according to their own system clock. So time in Bitcoin in the blockchain generally moves forwards. Sometimes it moves backwards a bit, but the main direction is forwards, just like time for us. It's good. So it's Two blocks could have timestamps which are in the, wrong order. in the wrong order. Exactly, yes. So a block could have a timestamp before its parent. Yeah, that would be valid as long as it's after the median of the previous 11. Right, so that median of the previous 11 means that time does indeed move forwards, but in a kind of, it doesn't have to be monotonically moving forwards. All right, next four bytes are the difficulty bits. We talked about this a bit. Uh, it's four bytes, little endian. The first byte is the exponent, and the remaining three bytes are the coefficient. Okay, so the, the block hash is checked against the bits, that's non-contextual, and these bits are worked out using that retarget um, that we did ourselves, and that is contextual. And then finally, we have the nonce, and this is just 32 bits of meaningless entropy. It's what the miner guesses in order to satisfy that proof of work. And once again, there's not enough space here, so we use non-space in the Coinbase transaction. Right, any questions about that? Yes. The question was, what would stop me from saying I found a block a day ahead of time? Um, no, it wouldn't be because it's more than two hours in the future. Yeah. Yep, and no other miners would build on it. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the timestamp isn't really that important? The only thing that timestamp is used for is uh, retargeting and, I guess, lock time, if you're using a time-based lock time. Um, so it's not, it's not that important to get it right to the second, but um, it should move forwards according to what the actual time is. Yep. Uh, why is the coin-based transaction used for the additional entropy for the nonce? Is this just... Because the miner needs to put it somewhere, right? And the, the coin-based is a transaction that is created by the miner. They have control over what goes in there. You know, they could introduce entropy in other ways. They could reorganize transactions or add additional transactions that would change the Merkle route. We don't really want them to do that because we don't want transaction selection to be based on something arbitrary like that. Um, so Coinbase is the easiest place that they can add entropy. They could add entropy to, in the timestamp, 
right? Because the timestamp doesn't need to be exact. They could change the seconds. And I think historically some miners have done that. Um, but really all they need to do is change some bits in this 80 byte object because then they can hash it and they'll get a different result. You'll hear much more about mining tomorrow from James. He's an expert. All right, before we continue, um, I'll just point out to something else in your Jupyter repo. There is a, in, in that blocks workbook, um, the final cell there is importing a block object from the library. And you could plug in any um, valid block from the network and run that and it will show you, <laughs> it's parsing that and it's showing you what the hash is and the difficulty. Um, so after this course, if you want to, you can play around with that and get a feel for what a block actually looks like when it's being parsed. Uh, I sent my slides to the Slack general channel. Those are the slides I'm using right now. In the Jupyter notebook? Oh, yes, sorry. This, these slides are Prezi. Um, actually, I can send you the... You can view these online. I'll send that to Slack after this. Yeah. Prezi is nice because it lets you zoom around, and if you don't have a lag on your laptop, it looks nice. All right, so let's talk a little bit about that Coinbase transaction. Um, this is money appearing magically out of a block, as you can see. Coinbase is the first transaction in the block. There's one and only one, and always one Coinbase transaction in the block. Exactly one. It doesn't spend UTXOs. So a UTXO is an unspent transaction output. Bitcoin is all about UTXOs. This whole construction of a blockchain, the only reason that exists is so that we have some agreements on what the set of unspent coins is. So UTXO is really important. And most transactions spend UTXOs and create new UTXOs. Right? They take existing outputs, they create new outputs. Coinbase is it's not so. They just create outputs. They don't spend any previous outputs. Produces new coins, 12 and a half every block at the moment, and it recycles the coins from the transaction fees. Um, yeah, for all the transactions in the block. Coinbase transaction only hit, ever has one input, and it's a weird input. The out point is null. When I say the out point, in a normal tr transaction input, the out point is pointing to the UTXO that it's spending. Right, the out point contains the transaction hash and the index of the output that is being spent. For a Coinbase, the out point is null because it's not spending any prior UTXOs. So the previous transaction hash is all zeros and the index is all Fs or minus one. The script sig, you saw this when you were parsing scripts earlier. It starts with the block height, right? Bit 34, which was a, a soft fork to the network a few years ago says that the Coinbase must start, the script sig in the Coinbase must start with the height of the block. And the reason we have that is to make sure that all Coinbases are unique. Prior to this BIP, it would be possible to mine two blocks with exactly the same Coinbase transaction, which would therefore have the same transaction ID. And the trans transaction ID is how we identify a transaction. If it's not unique, we have a problem. So BIP34 solves that by ensuring that Coinbase transactions are all unique. And because other transactions are spending from previous transactions, if all of the Coinbases are unique, all of the other transactions are unique. Um, there are two, well, two pairs of exceptions to that. Prior to BIP34, there were two pairs of, um, 
two pairs of Coinbases which had the same TXID. So there's a strange kind of anomalies in the blockchain. Coinbase has one input. It can have multiple outputs. The only thing really you need to know about those outputs is that the outputs add up to the, the subsidy plus the sum of all the fees. It can be less if the miner doesn't want to collect all of his fee for whatever reason or makes a mistake then he doesn't need to claim all of those Bitcoin. And since SegWit activation, one of the outputs must commit to the witnesses, right? Just like the block header is committing to the transactions using the Merkle root, one of the TX outs of the Coinbase is committing to the witness, sorry, the Merkle root of the witnesses. And this is how we made SegWit, SegWit a soft fork, right? Because we can't change the block header format and we need to commit to the witnesses somehow, so we commit to them in the Coinbase transaction. Any questions about that? <coughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, I'll talk about that a bit later. Okay, so how are transactions included in a block? A serial serialized block, as I said, contains a Oh, it comes in a, a message block, or since SegWit, a message witness block. That's how the block is sent over the peer-to-peer -peer network. And the message contains a serialized block, 80 bytes of header, which we just looked at, and then a count of the number of transactions, right? And the, the way that is expressed is what's called a compact int. And then all of the serialized transactions, one after another. And that can be up to four megabytes. Okay, so here's a question for you. Imagine I have a block at the top here. I've got a block header. Sorry, the writing's very small here. And I've got a, a transaction count of three, and then three transactions, and then I transmit it. What's to stop someone jumping in the middle, grabbing that, taking my block header, and then putting three different transactions in it, right? Changing the transactions in a block. What, what stops someone from man in the middle in my block? The hash of the previous transactions, maybe, kind of? Merkle root, yeah. Answer, the block header commits to the transactions using that Merkle root. It's not possible to change the transactions in the block because that would change the Merkle root and that would change the hash of the block and it would no longer be valid because it wouldn't hash to something below the difficulty. Right, changing just one bit of the input of a cryptographic hash completely changes the block head completely changes the digest, and it means you need to redo the proof of work. All right, so we say that um, we say that the proof of work is done over the block, over the transactions in the block. All right, question two: How do we fit one megabyte of transactions into the block? You've answered that already. Um, they're hashed into a 32-byte digest um, in the form of a Merkle root. Now. We could just put them all together and feed them into a hash algorithm and we'd get a digest at the end. Right, that's the commitment scheme. That digest is committing to all of the, the transactions in that, that serialized chain. Um, but instead, we use what's called a Merkle root. Right, that's a really useful commitment structure. Why? Um, this, I, I've explained this already. You, you, hash and pairwise until you get to a root, just like this, right? So you take transaction zero, one, two, three, four, you hash them each to get a leaf node, and then you hash them together and together and together until you get a root. And that's really useful because you can do a proof of inclusion in a Merkle set, Merkle tree, and it's a really compact proof. It's order log n. So a prover can show to me that something is included in that set without revealing the contents of the set and in a very compact way. Um, that Merkle proof consists of a path through the Merkle tree to the transaction. But note that we can't do a proof of exclusion, right? If the transactions were ordered somehow, or maybe we could, but in general, we can't show that a transaction was not in a block. We can only prove that it was in a block. And that's kind of important for, that has implications for how we build SPV clients, yep. 
all the witness data is in the Merkle root of the witnesses, which is in the Coinbase, which is in the Merkle tree of the transactions, which is in the header. Make sense? Yeah. <laughs> a little bit indirect, but that allows us to do it as a soft fork. Okay, so this is what a Merkle proof looks like. Imagine that we have the root of the Merkle tree up here. We know what that is because it's published on the blockchain. And someone wants to prove to us that HK is included in the block. Well, they give us HK. You know, we know what the serialized form of HK is, and or we know what transaction K is, and we can hash it to HK. And then it, they give us HL, HIJ, HMNOP, and H A B C D E F G H. Right? And then we can reconstruct the root of the Merkle tree by hashing our transaction with L, which we've been given. And the result of that is hashed with HIJ. And the result of that is hashed with HMNOP. And the result of that is hashed with HABCDEFG. And if that comes out to equal the root, then that's a valid Merkle proof. Someone has demonstrated to us that HK is indeed in the set. And they haven't give up, given us information about what else is in the set. And they've only had to give us four additional hashes. The size of the set here is 16, and they've given us four hashes, so it's order log n. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. So the, the prover gives us these blue intermediate parts. Right, they give us this one, this one, this one, and this one. They've given us four um, nodes in that tree. And we know HK because that's what we're asking for. And then we can reconstruct that path up to the root by hashing pairwise as we go. And if that results in the root, then we know that HK must have been included in the set. The one megabyte block. Yep. Um, I'm not sure I understand the 15 million. So the you're talking about two different concepts there. The one megabyte block size, which is now four megabytes after SegWit, um, that determines the throughput of the system. It determines how many transactions you can have every 10 minutes. The 15 million you're talking about is the number of Bitcoin in existence. Um, so it's, that's an amount rather than a, a flow. So those are, those are two, different, two different limits there. Okay. Any other questions about Merkle trees and proofs? All right, so why is that important? Why do, why do we want compact proofs? Well, one implication is we can have these things called SPV clients, simple payment verification, and you might have an SPV client on your phone or some low bandwidth device or some device with intermittent connection to the network, and these SPV wallets make use of Merkle proofs. The SPV wallets ask a full node for a proof that a transaction is in the blockchain, and the full node provides a chain of headers so that chain of headers is only about five megabytes for the entire blockchain, plus a Merkle proof to show that the transaction exists in one of those blocks, right? Because that block, that chain of headers includes all of the Merkle roots for all of the blocks, and you can use a Merkle proof to show that a transaction is included in that particular block. Does that make sense? However, there's a catch. Um, there's no proof of exclusion, like I said. You can't prove that a transaction was not included. So a prover could lie by omission, right? You could say to a prover, was this transaction included in a block? And they could say, nope, we don't know about that. And they have no way of proving to you that it wasn't actually, right? So an SPV wallet might have to ask multiple full nodes if they wanted to get trust that... Um, they're being told about all of the transactions. Does that make sense? 
You can't make up a new transaction, but you could lie about a transaction not being included. All right, that's all I'm going to say about SPV clients for now. Let's talk about forks and reorgs. So again, let's go back to that white paper. How do we reach consensus? Like, how does this system work? Um, Satoshi says, the majority decision is represented by the longest chain, which has the greatest proof of work effort invested in it. If a majority of CPU power is controlled by honest nodes, the honest chain will grow the fastest and outpace any competing chains. All right, so here's some bonus credit. Where's the obvious bug in that sentence? CPU power, yeah, maybe, max. Yes, yes. So here's a, here's a bug in the design and a bug in the initial implementation of Bitcoin. Satoshi assumed that the longest chain was the greatest proof of work. That's not true because you could have a really long chain with low proof of work if you messed around with the timestamps. Um, anyway, that's just this, another piece of trivia for you. All right, so what is the correct chain? It's the valid chain with the most proof of work, the most accumulated proof of work. So it's a chain that follows the consensus rules and has the most work on it. If there are two chains with the same amount of work, our node will consider the chain that it saw first as the valid node, right? So if you get a block at the same height with the same difficulty as you've already seen, you won't consider that the tip, you'll consider the one that you saw first as a tip. So what's a chain fork? Well, temporary chain forks, oh, I missed a C. They're expected and they're regular occurrence on Bitcoin. Um, block discovery is a random process, as I mentioned before. There's lots of different miners attempting to find blocks. And occasionally, because it's a random process, two miners will discover the blocks at the same time, or roughly the same time, within seconds. And miner A will transmit his block to the network. Miner B will transmit his block or her block to the network. And some nodes will see A first and some nodes will see B first and that's a chain split, right? Nodes who saw A first have a different view of what the, the chain is and nodes who saw B first. And one block chain forks happen once or twice a month. It's common, it's expected. That's what it looks like. So we have a blockchain and it's forked. So how do we resolve that? Well, when the chain forks, some miners will see block A first, and they'll start building on top of that. Some miners will see block B first, and they'll start building on top of that. And eventually, one miner will discover a block on top of their, their fork of the chain, and that will become the most worked chain. Nodes that were on the other tip will see that new, longer chain with more work, and they'll do something called a reorg. They'll reorganize themselves to follow that longer chain. That's what it looks like, right? So a miner discovered block A, a miner discovered block B. For some time there was disagreement on the network about which was the first one. And then some other miner mined block A2 on top of A. That becomes the longest chain and we reorg, all the nodes reorg back to A2. That resolves the chain split. Of course, it might happen that when block A2 is discovered, also block B2 is discovered, right? It's a random process that could happen, but that's really uncommon. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's expected, it's part of the random process of block discovery, it could happen. And then we just have like a three block reorg, that's fine, yep. So if you're monitoring the blockchain, you sent a transaction, you could see if you're querying it, if your transaction was included in this block, and then if it happened to occur during a chain port, you might see in the next block, my transaction is no longer included in the block and it's still it's back in the mempool. Yeah, the question is, um, if you're a node on the network and you transmit a, um, a, block, a transaction and you see it included in block A, or oh, sorry, block B, and then block B is reorged out of the chain, could your transaction disappear from, from the blockchain? And the answer is yes, that, that could happen. Um, Generally, what would happen is when block B is reorged out, your transaction that was in block B re-enters a mempool, and then it might be included in a future block. I mean, your transaction could have already been, been included in block A. There's nothing to stop that. Yep. So is Coinbase awarded to <coughs> both miners, or how is it 
if block B gets reorged out of the history, then the Coinbase in that block is never happened. It's, is it given out or? No, it just disappears from the history. And in fact, a Coinbase transaction can't be spent for 100 blocks after it's been mined. So reorgs of this kind, you know, if the miner on block B spent in block B plus one and then that got reorged out, that would be kind of, that could be messy. So there's this 100 block kind of waiting period before a miner can spend his Coinbase. Yeah. If one wants to investigate it worth that blocks, yeah. is there a data set which is available? Because I mean, the blockchain always keep track, of course, of non ordinary blocks. Right. It's like the heuristic is to wait for six blocks confirmation. Mm. But every once there has been a seven blocks reorg. Right. In the past, before, you know, Fibre or some. Mm. But how can. How could one check for this? I don't know. <laughs> Not that I know of. I mean, I've, I've looked for stale blocks in the past, and it's it's difficult because after they're no longer part of the blockchain, they don't get gossiped around. Just yeah, right. Blockchain.info has some orphans, but it's not guaranteed that every orphan will arrive there. Um, orphans, I prefer the word stale because orphan can be used for something different. You know, orphan implies there's no parent. Every block has a parent. Um, so stale blocks. A lot of people call them orphans. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, am I to understand then in this situation that the node, once block A2 takes over at the longest chain, that the node actually expunges itself at block B? Correct. So that in reality, other than when that fight for who's the longest chain goes on, you won't see stale blocks Correct. after some amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. It will keep the header in a record of the header um, in its uh, map block index. So if someone tries to tell it about the same header again, it knows that that's an old stale block that it's seen. But if you're starting up a fresh node and you're querying your peers for the blockchain, they won't tell you about stale blocks. It, they, it's as if they didn't ever happen. The only waste is really that 80 block header or 80 byte header yeah. over time. Yeah. No, that, that wouldn't be possible because block B depends on, I haven't given it a name, but the block before the fork. Right? A block is only valid contextually on top of the previous block. So if block A is the child of this block before the fork, it can't have siblings. Right? That's, that's, a blockchain is just a chain of width one. Yeah. There are other proposals like Ghost where Blocks can have siblings or uncles. Um, that doesn't exist in Bitcoin. <coughs> so a reorg involves rewinding one or more blocks, usually one in the normal course of things. It could be more. And then applying the blocks from the other side of the fork on top of that. Right? So for that reason, nodes need to keep some kind of undo record. Right, information about how to rewind their most recent blocks. So in Bitcoin Core, uh, we store this rewind information in the rev something, rev, and then a number, dot dat. Okay, any questions about reorgs? Yes. Yeah. The diagram is valid for a node or a full node, but regarding a SP wallet, yeah. this process should be the same, similar, Right, so an SPV client still should validate the work, right? It still receives the 80 bytes for the headers, and from that header, it can validate the work on that chain. It can make sure that the, it's a valid chain because it's got the right amount of work. So it, when it receives a new proof, it would see the longest chain, the most accumulated work. Okay, but in this example, if the wallet decided that uh, in a 
Okay. Um, it would need to remove those transactions from its database or ho however it's storing those transactions. Um, if you're using your SPV wallet for like transacting day to day, block B would only have one confirmation, right? And you shouldn't really trust a one confirmation transaction. You'd want to wait until it's buried by more work. So block B will never have more work or should never have more work applied on top of it because now block A2 is a tip. SPV clients are not the most secure because they, they don't have the full view of what's going on in the network. And I'll talk about that in the next session. Any more questions? All right, we're nearly at the end. Just a few more details about segregated witness. Does everyone know what SegWit is, segregated witness? Okay, segregated witness was a change to the protocol rules that came into effect in August of this year. And it, at a high level, it separates the signatures for a transaction from the transaction itself. The main reason we wanted to do this was to fix a bug called transaction malleability, which is where you could take a transaction and change the hash, change the identifier. SegWit fixes that. It also gives a block size increase. It also improves, fixes the quadratic hashing bug that Jimmy talked about. It also allows us to upgrade script. Um, so a whole host of goodies there. And it has a few, has a couple of impacts on how a block is serialized. Oops. Okay, so a transaction is serialized like this. Um, you can see the version, the inputs, the outputs, the lock time. That's for a pre-SegWit transaction. That's what Jimmy showed you. That's a serialization for a, a non-SegWit transaction. Um, for a SegWit transaction, we have the version, and then we have these special flags, 0001, and then the inputs, then the outputs, and then the witness, that's the signature for the, the inputs, and then the lock time. So it's slightly different. And if you're interested, you can look at BIP 144. That gives you the full details of how that, that works. Um, and what, what does that mean for a block? It means that when you send the header followed by the serialized transactions, you're now sending the header followed by the witness serialized transactions, so this version below. Okay, just means you have a bit more space in your block rearranging things. And then the other change is that we have something called a witness commitment in the header. So since, since SegWit was activated, you have these SegWit transactions, and one of the outputs from the Coinbase transaction, that's the first transaction in the header, must commit to the witness route. And that's the same way that the header is committing to the route of the transactions. This, this structure in the Coinbase is committing to the route of the witnesses, and the commitment looks like this. It's an op return, followed by these bytes, followed by the Merkle root of the witnesses. And that commitment is placed in the script pub key of one of the Coinbase transaction outputs. That's just where we put it. It, it means that we can activate SegWit as a soft fork. And that's written up in BIP 141. So a BIP is a Bitcoin improvement process. If you search for Bitcoin, BIP 141, it'll be the first thing you see on Google. All right, um, we're a few minutes early, but that's, that's all I had on blocks and the blockchain. Any, any questions before we wrap up? Yep. Yeah, uh, could you detail the difference between hard fork and soft fork? Yeah. And how exactly the uh, increase from one 
Sure. So, so the question was, what's the difference between a hard fork and a soft fork, and how does SegWit um, increase the block size from one megabyte to four megabytes without it being a hard fork? There's a simple answer to what the difference between a soft fork and a hard fork is. The simple answer is, um, in Bitcoin, you have these consensus rules. If you make the rules more strict, if you constrict what's possible, that's called a soft fork. And if you allow new things which were not previously possible, so you expand what's possible, that's called a hard fork. And a soft fork can be done in a forwards compatible manner, which means that nodes on the network um, don't need to upgrade all at the same time if there's a soft fork, because the new rules are stricter. The new rules still are valid under the old rule set. That's a soft fork. And that's really nice because otherwise you need this like hard flag day upgrade where everyone upgrades at the same time. A hard fork is the opposite. You're, you're making the rule set bigger. You're allowing more things, which means that if you do something under this expanded rule set, which was previously invalid, old, old nodes on the network will look at that and say, this is invalid. You're out of consensus. So that's a difference between a soft fork and a hard fork um, in its most simple <laughs> sense. Really. I think the most important thing is the coordination required. Like a soft fork does not require coordination between everyone at the same time. It, it's, it can be thought of in some senses as being more decentralized or more or less coordinated because people can upgrade to SegWit as they, as they want. Um, how does SegWit achieve a um, block size increase without being a hard fork? Well, it's all to do with how it's serialized and the fact that these, if we're talking, if our node is talking to a node which does not support SegWit, we can send them the top version. And if we're talking to a node that does support SegWit, we can send them the bottom version. And the top version will seem valid to a pre-SegWit node and the bottom version will seem valid to a SegWit node. Um, the, the difference is the pre-SegWit node is not verifying the witness. So there's a slight security consideration for those unupgraded nodes, but that's that's how we do it. That's how we make it a soft fork. Yeah. Sorry, uh, before you go, does that answer your question yeah, more or less? I thought that would be a hard limit, but like one megabyte block. Yeah. Instead, you can increase it to four megabytes. Yeah. Because for the pre-SegWit nodes, we're not sending this witness, and this witness can be quite large. It's a signatures, right? Signatures are like 72 bytes. So if we send the block with the serialized transactions without the witness, that, that still needs to be less than one megabyte. That, that serialization version is less than one megabyte. But with the witnesses, it can be up to four megabytes. Yep. Um, so the one the one megabyte limit still applies if you serialize it according to the top. And when when you have a SegWit transaction, that witness is quite large, and the inputs will actually be smaller, right? Because the inputs don't include the signature. So this this diagram is maybe not the best because it shows the inputs as being the same size. So The inputs are still there, but the signatures for those inputs are now included in the witness. In the witness. The witness program, yeah. And I guess I have the question, is there any other information that needs to be stored somewhere else? No. No, the information is stored in the, in the witness. So is the witness just like more No, it's the same amount of data. It's just we've moved it into the witness. And when we're talking to old nodes, we don't send them the witness. And when we're talking to upgraded nodes, we do send them the witness. But, but the, as far as that witness piece, it doesn't go towards the one megabyte. Cap. Correct, yeah. And that's really the only, that's why it's effective. That's why it's a block size increase, yeah. 
Correct. It, it doesn't count to the megabyte limit, yeah. Correct. Yep. So I, I heard a question about what technical improvements um, non-fully validating nodes can, can bring if they have uh, some of this data but not all the witness. And that was kind of implicit in the question of why is this beneficial? So the answer is that uh, the witness um, can be thrown away and yet in a, in a group, different nodes can some can keep the witness, and you can you can do more probabilistic, probabilistically complete validation. Right. So that when SegWit was <coughs> first talked about, it was suggested that you could, at some point in the future, throw away the witness. Um, once you validated the block, you could prune out that witness. We we have other forms of pruning already, and this would be like a, a deeper kind of pruning where we would throw away the signatures. That's not been implemented in Bitcoin Core. I don't know of any other implementations that have done that. So, so that's, that's part of the answer of why this may be beneficial. And then the other major thing is, of course, malleability. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that pruning the witness is really a, a huge okay. technical advantage. It's, it's possible. It might save on disk space but it means you can't serve up that block to other peers. Um, we have better ways of pruning, which is to pruning old, old blocks older than two weeks or however long. Yep. Oh. You, you first and then next. Yep. Awesome. Yes, sorry if I read the question specific point here, but um, because the transaction ID block is still limited to one MD, but it's like separate from the witness, does that mean you can have more transactions fit into Correct. The question was because um, the the complete transaction serialization size is not included in the one megabyte, can you now fit more transactions in a block? The answer is yes. Um, if everyone moves to SegWit, then we will have an effective block size of about 1.8 to 2 megabytes. Um, the nice thing about SegWit is people can upgrade as a see fit, and as they have time. Um, so this is a nice graph of what percentage of transactions are using SegWit. It looks kind of weird. I don't know why there's that big leap and then a fall, but at the moment, around, what is it, 10, 12%, 11% of transactions are using SegWit. So those people using SegWit have access to that scale independent of everyone else. They get cheaper transactions. It doesn't matter what everyone else does. The question was, does this kind of split Bitcoin into two different classes of node, miners who need the witness and full nodes who don't need the witness? No, that's not true. A full node does need the witness. A full node who is validating all of the rules on the network needs the witness to validate the transactions. Old nodes before version 13 will not ask for the witness. They'll, they'll see these transactions as valid, but they won't be validating part of the rules. Um, so if you want to be a full node, you need the witness, and you need to validate the transaction. Okay, last question. Yep. Okay, sure. The question was, how does SegWit solve transaction malleability? And I don't have the best diagram, but let's reuse this one. Um, so transaction malleability is, you can have the same transaction with a different signature, which therefore hashes to a different value, and it's still the same transaction, it's still valid. So you change the signature and you change that, the identifier of that transaction, and that can cause all kinds of problems. Um, 
the reason you can malleate a transaction is in this yellow part, the inputs, you have signatures. And the signature for a ECDSA signature includes a, an ephemeral key, a random number. So you could just choose a different random number and produce a new valid signature. It's a different signature, it's still valid, the transaction is still valid, but part of it has changed, and therefore the transaction identifier has changed, it's being malleated. In SegWit, we take that signature and we move it from the inputs to the witness. So if you change the signature, and the witness is not included in the, the hashing of the transaction. It's not included in the TXID. So when we, when we talk about the TXID, we, we're only talking about these fields here. And if we've removed the signature from the inputs, we've removed all sources of malleation from the TXID. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, I have more sessions on peer-to-peer -peer and mempool. But let's have 10 minutes before we start those, and let's get back here before 3.